We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Well, I don't know if we're all here, but uh, we can start with a bit of setting the scene. Welcome and good afternoon and um, welcome to this session about breaking the barriers to connectivity. My name is uh, Lisa Four. I'm the Director General of Etno, uh, representing the main telecom operators in Europe. And I will be the moderator of this session today, but first I'd like to set the scene. As uh, telcos, for us, connectivity is our business. That's our raison d'être. But Edno's members are involved in rolling out next generation networks from fiber to 5G, ensuring that European citizens, businesses, and public authorities are able to benefit from the promise of the digital uh, economy. But as we have to, uh, that as we're going to discuss here today it's not only plain sailing there are remain some obstacles to achieve uh, the objective of broad connectivity across our continent but also across the whole world so in today's society not being connected is an issue and as society becomes more and more digitalized we need all to be connected so therefore, we want to discuss today in this session why we're still far from universal connectivity. And uh, successful connectivity that doesn't depend only on one player in the market, nor even on one factor. Successful connectivity depends on technological, financial, and regulatory support. So today we want to first explore the main barriers to connectivity under these three categories, technology, finance, and regulation. Secondly, building on real life cases and case studies, highlight how innovative technologies, regulatory framework, financial and investment approaches or business model can help address these barriers. Thirdly, identify concrete policy solution that can be transposed or scaled up to uh, empower relevant stakeholders to achieve universal connectivity. And to help uh, with all of this, we have an excellent panel of experts uh, with us today, coming from all over the world, ready to share with us their perspectives on overcoming barriers to connectivity. Let me uh, present uh, the different panelists. Christina Arida is Head of Strategic Planning uh, Sector of the National Telecoms Regulatory Authority in Egypt. She has over 25 years of experience working with the Egyptian government in areas as internet development and related public policies. Welcome, Christine. We should have had uh, Jeff uh, Huston, but he's not feeling well today, so he's unable to attend, so he has to be excused. But we have Sophie Maddens, who is the head of regulatory and market environment division of the ITU Bureau of Telecommunication Development. Sophie has worked as a regulatory um, and policy expert in telecommunications and ITC sector in international and multicultural environments. Welcome, Sophie. We also have Robert Pepper, but I don't know if he's uh, joined us yet, but uh, he's the head of global connectivity policy and planning at Meta, focusing on infrastructure and connectivity, including new technology development, deployment and adoption. We have Lydia Stepinska Justasiak, uh, who is the Deputy Director of Department of Foreign Affairs in the Office of Electronic Communication of Poland. 
In her role, she is in charge of International Organizations Unit, as well as the Social and Economic Cooperation Unit. Welcome, Lydia. And uh, we have Anna Valero, who is the Director of Regulatory Affairs for Latin America in Telefonica, where she coordinates the positioning of the Telefonica Group in relation to regulatory issues in Telefonica's operations in Latin America. Welcome, uh, Anna. And uh, last but not least in our panel, we have uh, Julie Soller, who's head of global regulatory affairs, Amazon's project Cooper. Uh, this project aims to launch a constellation of low earth orbit satellites to provide broadband connectivity worldwide. She has also worked as the US State Department, the NTIA, and the uh, US Department of Defense. We also have our substantive rapporteur, who is Timia Soto at, uh, of the International Chamber of Commerce, and our remote moderator, Barbara Warner of the US Council for International Business. Thank you to for all for joining. So to kick off the discussion, uh, I will ask four of our speakers, Anna, Sophie, Lydia, and Christine to address how they see the barriers to connectivity being tackled using technology innovations, financial tools, and also regulation. And first we'll start with Anna, uh, who will represent Telefonica's view on the key elements to extend connectivity in unserved and underserved areas uh, and a case studies of Telefonica's work in Peru. Over to you, Anna. Okay, well, thank you, Liz, and thank you everyone for the invitation to participate in, in this meeting today. Uh, as, uh, I think that the main challenge that we have is that uh, even though governments and companies have been, wor been working for a long time in trying to close the digital divide, the reality is that we still have a challenge in terms of extending con connectivity to all citizens. The traditional approaches that we have followed, both com uh, companies and uh, governments, the, re the reality is that they have not worked as, as, as we expected. So we think that we need new approaches. We need to do different things to get different results. And in Telefonica, we think that these new models to extend connectivity have to be based in three aspects. The first one has to do with innovation, not only innovation from a technical, but also from a financial and com a commercial and also a regulatory point of points of view. The second one has to do with cooperation. We need cooperation between the different among the different stakeholders that are working uh, uh, to, in, in these projects to extend connectivity, uh, cooperation between public and, and, and private uh, uh, companies. And the third, third one has to do with sustainability, because the, we need that this, these new uh, rural projects uh, are sustainable, not only from a financial point of view, that is key, but also that they contribute to the development of the communities where they provide services. Mm -hmm. And working on this approach, on this um, uh, new approach, we have implemented in Peru the model Internet para Todos. It's a, it's a project, Internet para Todos is a project that uh, we have created based on these innovative and sustainability principles that I mentioned before. We, we are working on this project with uh, very relevant partners, with Facebook and the two Latin America regional development, development banks, the IDB and the CAF. And uh, we started in this project in 2019, and in, the, in, in these two years, we have been able to deploy more than 1,000, excuse me, uh, 1,600 sites, 4G sites, providing mobile services to more than 12,000 rural communities in Peru and, and, and extending coverage to areas where more than 2.5 million people live in, in, in Peru. The Internet para, para Todos model is based on a single wholesale mobile network for rural areas uh, that is uh, providing services in, in, in rural and remote areas of, of the countries. We think that this type of models can be extended to other countries in, in, in Latin America. And I think it's a very good example of how to work 
in new approaches to, uh, to, to make sure that connectivity reaches everyone in, in, in remote areas in less developed countries. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And uh, over to you, Sophie. Um, I'd like to hear from you what it means to create fit for purpose, flexible, and uh, we actually wrote future uh, proof, but I don't think there's anything like future proof. I think it should be future oriented regulatory framework to respond to the challenges of digitalization. Over to you. Thank you very much, Lisa, and very happy to be with all of you here. Old trends, many, many uh, people with whom we've worked in the past. So indeed, Lisa, the fit for purpose, flexible and future oriented. Thank you very much for that regulatory frameworks. We see them as the only effective way to go in responding to the challenges of this digital transformation process that we have seen has been turbocharged by the COVID crisis. Today, we see more than ever, and we still have, have billions of people that un are unconnected, but we've seen in the COVID crisis that this meaningful connectivity is key. And I liked what Anna said as well, we need those new approaches, innovation, cooperation between stakeholders and sustainability. So let me just take you on a very quick journey through the digital transformation, how it has changed the regulatory approaches. Because we know that digital is continuing to prove access to and delivery of services across multiple industries. So Anna mentioned cooperation between public sector, private sector, but let me add in there as well, it's cooperation across the sectors because ICTs have really moved beyond just the simple communications. And we've seen how much digital has become the foundation for every economic sector, business performance, and our own individual growth and health. So digital is supporting all sectors of the economy. It's changing the societies, the markets, the countries, the regions, and regulation. So there have been huge opportunities, but with those opportunities come challenges. And yes, I do agree. We need innovation, sustainability, and collaboration. Collaboration between policymakers, regulatory authorities, and other stakeholders, both at national, regional, and international level. We had the Partner to Connect Focus Area 3 working group meeting yesterday about building digital ecosystems. And it was brought in there. We need the collaboration and cooperation, even with consumer associations, trade associations, so really the multi-stakeholder environment. We're connecting with our counterparts across economic sectors, industries, and end users, and developing that regulation and government interventions to leverage that digital transformation as an engine for that sustainable development. So we need those economic and digital regulatory tools, processes, procedures, and mechanisms to really promote that engagement of that broad and diverse range of stakeholders. Internet para todos in Peru, we need all stakeholders to collaborate with us. And indeed in the countries and, re and regions. And what I add there is as well, and Pepper will very much like what I say, we need the data so that we foster that informed, inclusive, and evidence-based rulemaking and decision-making and always have that economic and social impact in mind. So here are some of the core elements of collaborative regulation. We need the space for digital experimentation. We still need those pro-competition frameworks. We need regulatory incentives. And in the COVID pandemic, we've seen many of the stakeholders stepping up to facilitate rather than gatekeep, but facilitate, regulators as facilitator. We need the stakeholder engagement vehicles. We also need to, those robust and enforceable mechanisms for consumer protection. We need regulatory impact assessments. We need those agile data-driven monitoring systems based on standards for the interoperability of data systems. We need effective channels for dynamic collaboration amongst the regulatory authorities, not just in ICT telecoms, but with the other regulatory authorities, energy being one. We need that regional and international cooperation, and we need the regulatory expertise. Let's think about capacity development as well of our regulators. And there's also a, 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 take, a, a need for a new take on financing, but I'll talk about that in the next round. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Sophie. Um, 
And if I turn to, to Lydia, listening to, to Anna and Sophie talking about innovation, stakeholder engagement, and also uh, regulators as facilitators, what, what is your view on this and, and how can a national regulator support connectivity? Thank you. Oh, uh, oh my God, I have nothing to add to, to such extensive uh, Sophie's comment, uh, but uh, I can give some examples from uh, our area uh, of responsibilities uh, of, a, of a regulator in Poland. And uh, when we think about uh, future-proof uh, regulatory approach, uh, we can distinguish two, two areas of our activities. First, uh, which is uh, strategically important, is of course infrastructure. And here uh, we believe that investors uh, and, and service providers and telecommunication companies, uh, big and small, uh, should have access to re reliable uh, information um, on uh, quality of uh, networks, accessibility of networks, and potential areas for uh, investments. Therefore, we created one single information point with telecommunication data. Uh, this point aggregates data from many different sources, uh, not only telecommunication data reported by uh, operators. Uh, in this context, it is important that in, in uh, our case, on Polish market, we have more than 5,000 uh, telecommunication operators. Of course, the uh, majority of them uh, are small, but still uh, they also need exactly the same information. Uh, and uh, this point uh, aggregates data also from Central Office of Geodesy and Cartography and General Statistical Office. And it gives uh, very precise and accurate information on uh, wide gaps and uh, area for uh, investments. Uh, it is also a tool for consumers uh, and they can check availability uh, of uh, telecommunication services as well as as uh, parameters of uh, these services. Uh, and uh, this is our experience. We are ready to share uh, with other countries, uh, thanks to collaboration with International Telecommunication Union, including uh, SOFIS division. Uh, we, we have the chance to share our experience and help other uh, countries, uh, particularly developing countries from Africa region and also from, from, uh, from East. Uh, and uh, well, because we, we believe that uh, when we were at the beginning of this way, uh, just after uh, our accession to, to the European Union, we had the chance to benefit from experience uh, of Western countries. And now uh, we, uh, we want to give it back somehow to, to countries uh, that need it. And I mentioned the second area, which is also important, uh, skills, uh, because uh, we are perfectly aware that from the perspective of investment, um, entrepreneurs uh, must know that uh, there will be demand for telecommunication services. And uh, we know that technologies are widely diffused uh, and used only when they are trusted. Uh, therefore, we... Firstly, on a national level, we develop uh, educational programs uh, addressing particularly the most vulnerable groups like uh, children, teenagers, and uh, elderly people. Uh, and at the international level, uh, I have the pleasure to be a chairwoman of the group on capacity building initiatives, uh, advising ITU on area of capacity building development. And thanks that uh, on the one hand, I have the chance to uh, observe uh, other regions uh, and uh, their specific uh, challenges. And I can also share our experience widely uh, and help other regions and other countries with uh, strategies of capacity building development. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lydia. 
And Christine, we now heard about the experiences in, in uh, Poland, um, but you will uh, present the connectivity dimension of Egypt's region national initiative of the government uh, of Egypt, Decent Life, uh, that provides high-speed connectivity to the inhabitants of rural areas. I think uh, these uh, panels also, uh, apart from discussions, uh, are good for knowledge sharing. So over to you, Christine. Thank you, Lisa, and can you hear me well? Okay, so good afternoon from Cairo. And uh, so sorry, I could not be in uh, Poland, uh, but I would like to start by congratulating the government of Poland for a very successful IGF. Also thank the MAG for, uh, for putting all this together. And um, so as, as, as other speakers have mentioned, as, uh, and as have you, you have said, Lisa, uh, it, it is true that uh, there's been so much effort put into, you know, um, getting connectivity universal. And especially those very uh, few last years of the pandemic, have, um, efforts have multiplied everywhere uh, to, to get this uh, existential need, I would say existential need for connectivity there. But um, we've all seen the last facts and figure report that came out from the ITU, and it, um, it shows that we still have 2.9 billion people to be connected. And the numbers that actually uh, I stopped at is that 96% 90, uh, of those still unconnected come from the developing world. So where I actually come from. Also in Africa, the region where I come from, 33% of individuals only are using the internet. So obviously, uh, it seems that stretching this last mile of connectivity or actually co connecting those uh, remaining billions may prove to be more challenging than the connections we've already made. And this is not this is because we're not just merely connecting or extending connectivity, but we're actually trying uh, to put an ecosystem uh, uh, together, which has to come together in order to uh, provide meaningful access and get those remaining billions online. So um, I would like to touch upon um, in, in, my, in my intervention on um, how we in Egypt are trying to um, overcome those barriers and uh, create that enabling ecosystem. Um, as you said, the initiative is called the Decent Life Initiative and it's not just about connectivity. It's a national uh, mega project, which spans a lot across uh, many uh, different dimensions. So uh, addressing the point that we need intergovernmental cooperation, on all the different verticals. So the, the, the collaboration that Sophie also was talking about. And the initiative has got the highest political support because it was actually endorsed and launched by the president of the Fatah in 2019. Um, and it, it looks at the very deprived uh, communities. It looks at the um, villages, the very poorest villages um, uh, of Egypt and it targets 58% uh, of the Egyptian population, but it will start uh, uh, living in 4,500 villages, but it will start in its first phase with uh, the, those that have a poverty rate of 70% or higher. So we're actually trying to leapfrog uh, those that are most needed. And when we're leapfrogging this and look at the digital dimension of it, we're not just getting barely any connectivity there. We're, um, the idea is to put together fiber connectivity or fiber to the home, which is uh, an infrastructure that may not be available in all places in Egypt, but when addressing those most deprived, we're trying to be future oriented, as was mentioned, in order to boost innovation and in order to, you know, be uh, look at the future and have have them come uh, uh, to the online world. So um, uh, one other thing that we're addressing is um, how can regulations can help get that infrastructure together. So uh, um, while putting um, uh, mobile sites for mobile connectivity, uh, there is government funding. So there is public private partnership, mainly through universal service funding. Uh, but the regulatory uh, intervention here is that we're enforcing site sharing, we're enforcing infrastructure sharing in order to, you know, uh, uh, make a viable business case uh, through public and private uh, funding. The third thing uh, uh, that is uh, that we're doing is that we're also looking at how to stimulate demand. So uh, we're availing uh, digital financial services through post offices, uh, uh, developing those uh, postal digital postal services uh, in order to uh, have financial inclusion, and then uh, focusing the fourth dimension on capacity building components. Uh, together uh, with uh, the society or uh, societal uh, civil society. So, so here we're trying to address, as I was saying, four main challenges. One is 
how to boost innovation and be future oriented. And this is leapfrogging with infrastructure, with the highest technology, how uh, to achieve sustainability through intergovernmental cooperation and uh, how to address funding and uh, the, the, the issue of uh, 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 business models. And this is public private partnership. And the last thing is the union of government and society to develop human capital and uh, fuel innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, I will open the floor just for a few questions before we, we head on. If there are any, uh, please raise your hand if, if you have any questions or I see there is a, a comment. comment. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Marie Noemi says it should be recognized, especially by public authorities, that currently the system is flawed in the sense that telecom operators do not have a fair return on their investments, and that they cannot price the use of their infrastructures appropriately so that telecom have the capacity to invest more. Wonder if the panelists have a comment in response. If I may, uh, I, uh, I believe that uh, broadband mapping is exactly uh, for this reason. The, what we achieve uh, thanks to precise uh, mapping and collection of such data uh, is, uh, is information necessary to assess potential revenue from investment. Yeah. Uh, Maybe. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say something. Anna, Anna, please, you go first because I was going to refer to Internet Paratoros. No, please, Robert, go ahead. I, I, go, I can't go back with my question. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, I'm uh, Robert Pepper at uh, uh, Meta. And, I, I, and as, as Anna mentioned, we are um, one of the partners in the Internet Paratoros uh, project in Peru. Um, and one of the things that made that successful, and this goes back to something that Sophie said that's extremely important. Um, policies and regulation in Peru were changed that actually completely uh, changed the incentives for investment. Um, and by separating the rural areas where it's most difficult from the urban areas where there are profits and you can have the competition, um, the the, the government, the regulators created something called an um, uh, infrastructure mobile, uh, infrastructure, um, I, I forgot exactly, Anna, what it is, an infrastructure, um, mobile, mobile infrastructure um, operator, which created the opportunity for a shared wholesale um, radio access network that any operator can then attach to and use at the edge. And after 20 years of government policy, traditional universal service, um, satellite phones, all of those things, nothing worked, but by changing the regulatory framework and changing the incentives for private sector investment, it attracted investment um, that, as Anna said, is, is now providing service to um, you know, 12,000 rural communities that had nothing. It wasn't even an upgrade from 2G to 4G. It was nothing to 4G, right, Anna? So that, that I think goes directly to the question. It's about the incentives and the ability to get a return on investment that you know, fundamentally the, the cha fundamental changes in regulation enabled that and attracted investment, not just from to the traditional operator, but also from, from uh, Meta. Uh, and with, by the way, there's no universal service money there to do this. Mm -hmm. Interesting, and, and also showing uh, how much regulation means for investment. Over to you, Anna. Yes, I, I, I agree completely with what Robert mentioned. And also I would like to stress that this, uh, the, the, the question about investments is critical here. We have to look for models that will attract investments that bring the, 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 the legal certainty that operators and investors need to, to, to put in place this kind of of projects and regula regulation is, is key. Is key in the, as, as Robert mentioned, the, the the different approach that the regulator took in Peru uh, really facilitated the implementation of this model. And it's not so easy to transfer it to other countries in Latin America. This we need this kind of model that allow for innovation, that allow for new ways of addressing the problems in, in rural areas. 
and and I think that having a a, a regulator, I, I I like this 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 concept that Sophie mentioned before, the regulators as facilitators. I think it's it's very important this approach for rural areas because if we try to transpond the regula the regulation that we have in urban areas to rural areas, we are we are going to fail in extending the services. Thank you. I see Sophie has her hand up. Sophie, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. I think we're all, we, in all our interventions, we covered a number of things. So um, uh, Lydia mentioned the mapping. So evidence-based decision-making is key. Evidence is key for investment. Then we also mentioned the regulatory tools and investment, and Christine mentioned the infra share, infrastructure sharing. And one thing that I think is vital as well is the demand creation. As we collaborate across the sectors and we really foster that demand, we foster the demand, we create the demand, we work with government to create the necessary demand, we work with anchor institutions. I think that for, for operators really uh, provides the incentive to continue investment, uh, continue investment and innovation. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you. And demand is certainly an important part too. Um, now we'll go forward with the uh, theme of technology innovation. So, um, and using technology and innovation to address uh, some of the global connectivity. And uh, we'll use a specific example of Amazon's uh, Kuiper uh, project. So a short presentation from Julie. Thanks, Lise. It's just such a pleasure to be here today and see so many friends. Um, it's been a while. At Amazon, we're dedicated to furthering innovation and technology for our customers, partners, and communities. And through Project Kuiper, we're working to help bridge the digital divide, ensuring that broadband services are accessible, reliable, and affordable on a global scale. Kuiper is a constellation of Ka band satellites in low Earth orbit that will provide high quality broadband service to tens of millions of unserved and underserved communities around the world. Our initial constellation is 3,236 satellites which will deploy at three altitude and inclination combinations between 590 and 630 kilometers. And we chose those particular altitudes in order to provide low latency service that's similar to fiber and also to safely deorbit our satellites at the end of their mission life. Our design decisions combined with inventions like phased array antenna technology and the ability to connect to our global infrastructure like internet exchange points and our customer service centers will allow us to achieve three important goals with Kuiper, the broad geographical coverage, high quality service and affordable equipment and plans. We're moving very quickly. Just last month, we submitted plans to the FCC to launch and deploy two prototype satellites by the fourth quarter of next year on an all new rocket from ABL. And we continue to expand our capabilities with more than 22,000 square meters of R&D facilities and we're now beyond 750 employees uh, just working on Project Kuiper. Kuiper is a global service and we'll need licenses in every country in order to provide that service. Each country is unique in its requirements and timelines. A predictable and enabling regulatory environment with low administrative and financial overhead fosters invention and, and long-term investment in projects like Kuiper. Ultimately, it minimizes cost to the customer, an important factor in bridging the digital divide. There are three essential ingredients for an enabling regulatory environment. The first is spectrum access. 
in, in the case of our initial system, that's access to the KA band, which is already allocated to the fixed satellite service. The second is fair rules, rules for sharing that spectrum that support new entry and competition. And the third is light touch administrative and regulatory processes for license applications and grants. We're betting big on Kuiper. We've committed to investing more than $10 billion to make Kuiper available. It's an incredibly exciting and rewarding project for me personally, having worked at the State Department on, on bridging the digital divide, um, a mission that's only risen in importance and also helping to shape the ITU rules that enable non-geostationary systems at WRC 97 and 2000. So it's a great time to put them to such important use. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. It's, it's certainly a very impressive uh, project, uh, the Kuiper project. And um, if we look at it, it, it required, as you're saying, considerable investments uh, by Amazon. And uh, of course, you must have seen a demand for this service. But if I turn to both Lydia and Anna to have some, some further thoughts, we, we discussed uh, before how regulation can change uh, the uh, appetite for investment uh, in both ways. But um, do you think we need, uh, for example, more public-private partnerships in order to, to reach to the uh, remote areas where the business case is, is difficult? Or is it enough just to, to change the regulation? If I ask Lydia first, how do you, how do you see this? Uh, I totally agree that uh public-private partnerships are very important, particularly that uh, Polish telecommunication market is very specific. We have um, one of the cheapest uh, telecommunication services in the European Union, and uh, therefore uh, potential revenues uh, are quite limited. Uh, and uh, therefore, first, uh, stable regulatory environment and predictable law uh, help, definitely, uh, and uh, which is uh, also very important in, in the context of telecommunication market, is a possibility to utilize European funds uh, for investment in telecommunication infrastructure. Thank you. Anna? Well, I think that uh, regulation can be key in attracting uh, uh, investments and can be key in making um, business cases uh, sustainable. And I think that's, the, that's one of the key issues for us. And what that's, that was one of the key challenges for Internet para Todos, because we wanted a sustainable business model, uh, de depending on uh, subsidies from different, uh, either from the Universal Service Fund or from, or from directly from governments is, 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 is complex because if you are not able to develop a sustainable model, once you don't receive that uh, subsidies, uh, the model will not continue and, and you will not be able to do the um, network upgrades and, and the evolution of the network that you will need. So uh, I think that the, the relevant thing is that, right, that the, the regulation will help to make this model sustainable, reducing the regulatory burdens, uh, 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 defining specific conditions more favorable for rural areas. To give you an example, uh, Julie mentioned before about the spectrum cost. And I, I think spectrum for, for, for mobile operators is key. And in some countries in Latin America at this moment, the, 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 the way the, the, the spectrum fees are defined really impede that we develop a service in, in, in rural areas. We have to review this. We have to review all the, the, the regulations in general to try to, to move towards a more innovative approach uh, we, we have to, to put in place these these mechanisms to um, evaluate the regulatory measures and identify which one are contributing to the extension of services and which one are not being um, successful in, in in the goals of extending services. I, I think we, we need to review the approach uh, from the regulatory point of view to facilitate all these models. We 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 have reviewed many different aspects from competition 
to to a network to to, to a spectrum assignment to uh, infrastructure, infrastructure development rules that can be uh, reviewed to adapt to the specific conditions of rural areas. Thank you, Anna. Over to you, Robert. If you uh, look at the technologies and, and uh, if we, we talked about innovation and, and here we've heard about satellites, there are many technologies uh, that can deliver connectivity. What are your views on, on uh, what can fundamentally change the network ecosystem from the perspective of, perspective of META? Thanks, uh, Lisa. Good to see you. Uh, Good to see a lot of my, my friends here, including, I guess, Sam is in the room, at least virtually. Um, so, you know, traditionally, there have been the, the, net, the networking technologies and uh, for private sector investment, um, you know, the cost structure and density limited where there would be the a business case for deploying the technology. And then there was a gap to reach the lower density areas, the more difficult areas. And that's where traditionally we've had things like, you know, universal service support or other things to close that gap. Uh, you know, I think we're at a point now we're really lucky because the new technologies that are coming on to provide uh, broadband connectivity, um, number one, they're becoming much more robust, much more reliable, um, and lower cost. And you know, uh, you know. Uh, Julie's and you know Kuiper is really exciting. We've heard for you know years that um, you know satellite broadband, you know lower cost, low latency was going to be here. It was always two years away. It's not two years away. It's here, and and it's it's now. Uh, that is really significant. On the terrestrial side, we're seeing similar kinds of technology breakthroughs. Look, if if you think about it. You know, there's been a, a, a major technology trend and a shift going back 40 years, right? It began in the 1980s and 90s, and that shift was from analog to digital, right? And that, as we move from analog to digital, it lowered the costs. And as it lowered costs, the operators could have a business case to provide service in areas that previously had not been affordable, but now are for sustainable business. And then in the first decade of um, the 21st century, the, the, the big shift was from physical to virtual or hardware to software, you know, software to find networks um, that lowered the cost to put more features into the cloud, more functionality. So the operators you know, could do more um, at lower cost. And we're now uh, at the next stage in this you know, long technology trend, which is a move towards disaggregated interoperable technology so that you can get the best of breed at each layer of the stack and lower the costs and, and, and create business models, sustainable business models, uh, you know, where previously they didn't exist. Uh, the best example of this you know, trend towards, you know, and the use of uh, disaggregated interoperable technologies, uh, the one that everybody talks about is Open RAN. And you know, Open RAN, uh, which is the open radio access network, um, you know, being able to have plug and play so that any operator can use best of breed at each layer of that stack and then also connecting back into the core. And in fact, in uh, Internet Partodos, we're using Open RAN and it, it it, it's been a breakthrough because the, the cost of that technology has come down. And that's an, an, the ex, a great example, by the way, of the shared network. And I remember the, 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 in English, the um, uh, regulatory structure that's enabled that investment is called a Rural Mobile Infrastructure Operator, an RMIO. And effectively, it allowed developing a new business model called Network as a Service. And by having the shared wholesale network as the service, uh, and it, you don't need this in urban areas where there's a sustainable model and high density, but when we're getting out to the rural areas, we're now able to provide broadband, mobile broadband service where it did, never existed and using these lower cost radio access network technologies. The last point is um, 
We've worked with uh, uh, Analysis Mason, which many of you know is a world-class uh, consultancy. And they looked at this um, model of disaggregated technology that um, is really being developed and promoted by an organization called the Telecom Infra Project. And most of the major mobile operators around the world uh, are all members of that. And, um, you know, Lisa, at least, you know, your members have, have all, you know, signed up. They, they was a, you know, an, an MOU for deploying Open RAN and most, and I think they're all TIP members, but the analysis Mason looked at the economic impact globally and then in, in two special cases, India and Sub-Saharan Africa on this move towards this disaggregated technology model. And they looked specifically at Open RAN. The base case for Open RAN, um, which is, moderate development, moderate deployment, um, would contribute to global GDP between now and 2030, it would contribute an additional $285 billion to global GDP. If that deployment is accelerated and policies like the uh, RMIO in Peru can do that, the accelerated deployment of Open RAN could result in an, in an incre inter incremental contribution to GDP by 2030 of $725 billion US. In India, the, the accelerated deployment case could lead just in India to $129 billion incremental GDP growth. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, it could contribute an additional $135 billion to, to the GDP uh, across the, the continent. This is really important. That's why this trend towards disaggregated technologies, lowering the costs and giving the operators a better business model and closing the gap. So there are fewer places that we need interventions such as traditional universal service and new things. The last thing is public-private partnerships, I think are extremely important. That's what's going to make it work. But in the past, when we've talked public-private partnership, it's been private sector and government and we can't forget, especially at the IGF, that is multi-stakeholder, um, you know, at its roots, that, mo that the, it's really a broader partnership. It's public uh, sector, it's private companies, and it's, it's the technical community and it's local communities, it's NGOs. So the partnership has to be broader based. And, and that's what we're, happy, what we're seeing as well, especially in these rural areas, with things like community networks using some of these disaggregated technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And, and I find it uh, extremely interesting how technology also, as you were saying, is creating a new business model. So it's, it's uh, in, in a network that is seen as the business model itself. So it's uh, an interesting shift uh, because of, of, as you're calling, a network as a, as a service. So um, very interesting uh, thoughts on, on the technology side, um, but uh, nothing while uh, that initial investment in infrastructure is very important still. So, so I think we, we must sustain uh, the investment and, and keep the revenue streams. So we have talked about investment, we have talked about development, innovation um, and new services. So if I am to, to, to ask you, Christine, on, on how do we keep the revenue stream uh, to enable these uh, initial services to scale up, what are your views on this, Christine? Uh, well, uh, Lisa, here maybe I, um, I would like to say that uh, in order to, to make the, the, the business sustainable, if I take examples from Egypt, where there are areas where ARPU is really, really low. And when uh, when you go to the telecom operators, they actually don't see why they should be investing here. So of course, one model is the universal service um, as a tool or public-private partnerships. And uh, the other model is actually to, uh, to stimulate the demand. And here as well is where the public sector can actually play a role. So let me bring a real life example from one of our cities, which uh, is in the southern uh, part of Egypt. Southern part of Egypt is an area that is less developed in terms of infrastructure. And here I talk about the city of Aswan. The city of Aswan has 350 inhabitants, 350,000 inhabitants. And, um, and, and the case here is that 
the, the, the digital sector, the government and the private sector have cooperated with the municipality to build the infrastructure, in that case, um, mobile towers and extending reach, fiber reach again. But the most important is working on implementing ICT enabled programs to allow people to access local services through mobile applications. So um, this was coupled with uh, human capacity development through three tracks, which happened actually in us one. One was focusing on digital skills development in schools, so targeting uh, the, the younger generations. The other was qualifying uh, graduates and micro startups uh, by uh, providing them with e-marketing skills and uh, digital transformation programs. And uh, the third was actually eliminating digital illiteracy, which is quite common in, in those areas and for the different uh, society segments. The result is actually development in as one which we've uh, actually uh, witnessed. Uh, it, it, it now hosts one of the very first innovation hubs uh, with a fund of 18 million Egyptian pounds, which is something actually that I believe very important for the local community because it promotes technology-driven innovation. And then it offers incubation um, for local youth uh, entrepreneurs to start their uh, ICT projects. What does this mean? It means that it has generated demand within the local community to actually use the internet in a very meaningful way. And I think that's important. So the coupling of human capacity development through the municipality, the government and the public uh, uh, and the public and the private sector, I think it's very important uh, to, to, to put together the, the ecosystem. Thank you, Christine. And, and I must say, uh, looking at connectivity, it's interesting to see how much it can enable, but also how um, complex a topic it is in technology and how the, the stakeholder uh, uh, we need to include, etc. So I'll uh, look to you, Sophie, and, and ask, uh, in addition to when we look at the business investment, we might uh, consider other drivers of, of connectivity. So from, from your perspective, what are the other drivers of connectivity that you see? So Lisa, I'd like to build on what Christine said and others have said, because we all know that financing universal connectivity is going to be a massively collaborative effort. And Christine, your example is absolutely amazing. So how can we be more creative about devising new models that rely on a combination of that monetary and non-monetary contributions and also that collaboration? Because we've seen significant shifts in the approach to funding universal access. There is still mention of universal service funds, but what I like today is that there's really been that insistent on fostering demand, fostering collaboration. And so we've seen this, these different developments in the infrastructure play sphere, in the public broadband and digitalization funding mindset. So let me throw a, thing, a few ideas in, whether it's about pooling financial resources, sharing open access infrastructure, leveraging public money to raise private funds. The goal really is to stretch the limited financial and non-financial resources as far as possible. Because Marie Noemi mentioned, there's a risk for telecom operators. So for anybody investing in the space, it has to be worth the risk. And the fundamental funding policy and regulatory challenge is to make those rural and low income areas and the marginalized population worth the risk for the private sector and other co-investors. So it's about setting priorities in policy strategies, but also in recovery and stimulus plans. It's about extending the sources of funds and using that combination of the monetary and non-monetary uh, contributions. And it's about making smarter investments, moving away from funding to financing and fostering co collaboration, impact investment funds, and building sustainability in, from the start. So think about co-investing funds, funds of funds, pay or play obligations, non-financial mechanisms that are available to mitigate risk, both on the regulatory and policy incentive side and financing side. Regulatory policy incentives, we mentioned some, but think about dig once, dig smart policies, the regulatory sandboxes to facilitate innovation, and really clear policy and regulatory frameworks that set the tone for the se sector. And financing comes along with projects, programs, practices, sustainable business models, thinking of both the demand and the supply side. 
And so we do mention, I would want to mention Giga because connecting every school to the internet by 2030, that's something that ITU and UNICEF have been joined forces on since 2019. So some 3.6, actually it's, uh, it's not 3.6 billion people anymore. There's much, much less people in the world that do not have access to the internet right now. And we saw the COVID bump, bump. but it means exclusion. So Giga brings the power of meaningful connectivity to fast track young people's access to educational resources and opportunities, but not just the children, the communities as well. So we're looking to equip every child with the digital public goods they need and make them empowered to shape the future they want. Because at the end of the day, that's what we wanna do. We want to shape the future and shape future generations. So I just wanted to touch upon that. At the end of October, we hit a massive milestone with 1 million schools mapped across 41 countries. And one of the aspects of GIGA is also the financing. So there's the, the proposal to launch the connectivity bond to provide significant upfront funding needed to accelerate critical infrastructure investments and mobilize those public and private capital. So these, this is what we really need to talk about. We need to think about USO 2.0 to really bring our hands together to finance this connectivity. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Sophie. And um, I'll open the floor to see if there are any questions here before we have to close in, in, in four minutes. Um, I think it has been extremely rich discussions and, and input from all the panelists and, and also a, a good uh, remark from uh, Marie Nomi. We have so, the question from physical part of the event. Yeah. Hello, uh, it's Uchas Authority for the Records uh, from Georgia, uh, Georgia and IGF. My question is related uh, about the models to solve the challenges of non-connected uh, society of our globe. What do you think about the community networks models? Could be these models useful to solve the problems uh, of non-connected population? Thanks. We support of big telcos. Thank you for the question. Community networks. Uh, Anna, maybe uh, you can give a first go on connect, uh, community networks. Sure. Thank you. Well, I, I think that community networks can be a model that can help to, to extend services in, in rural areas. The, the thing that we have to have in mind is that sometimes they, they don't have the technical knowledge and the financial capability to, 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 to go beyond just a small village and to extend it, it into a project that can cover uh, more, um, more villages and, and to extend service to more people. I, we have seen many of these models in, in, in Latin America. Some of, some of them, they are very successful, but uh, to be very honest, I think that uh, uh, models like Internet para Todos have been able to, to extend services in very large areas of the country and, and bring in services to a very big amount of people. That doesn't exclude any other, any other model, but uh, we, we, we think that um, uh, these kind of models based also on mobile technologies are um, um, better in terms of allowing customers to use devices with low prices and that are available in the market. And in many cases they already have because they maybe they, they live in areas without coverage, but they move to areas where there, are, there is coverage. So they, they already are using mobile services. Uh, we are seeing many uh, cases of community networks in Latin America, but as I say, in general, they are small and they are difficult to escalate. But of course they are feasible models, and, and, and I think that also they, they need support from the regulation. Thank you, Anna. Anyone else wants to chime in? Robert? Um, just building on what Anna said, I think that, um, uh, as, I, as we've both mentioned, that the, the places where it's more difficult for the mobile operators to build is, is shrinking, but they still exist, and so it becomes important to, uh, again, fill gaps. And one of the things that community networks have done 
and where they're very, I think, uh, complementary to uh, traditional operators is help sort of create the market. So it's part of the market creation and the demand creation. And then when, you know, th there are more people there connected and using services, then partnering with the mobile operators, really, because what people want is the, are the traditional services with the roaming and the other things. So I see these as complementary. Um, <clears throat> I think Internet Para Todos with uh, network as a service for the wholesale access can be part of that as well at the edge. And then there are satellite systems and services. We, although, you know, in addition to Kuiper, which is direct to the, will be directly to the consumer, the end user, you know, we've been partnering with other satellite operators to bring the backhaul to a community and then using community Wi-Fi. And so there's a, there are a variety of different uh, ways to do this, but I think that they can be very complementary. and community networks really can help create the market. It's a market creation for the um, more sustainable, uh, 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 trad more traditional you know, business models. Thank you. And I think that was the bell telling us that we're now at the end of our session. I'll very quickly wrap it up. Uh, first, thank you to all the panelists and, and also to, to Barbara and uh, Timea for helping us preparing this session. It's, it's a great pleasure being here and, and uh, discussing these very important things. But if we are to look at the discussion today, as I said, it was extremely rich. I think our panel experts has demonstrated that I started with saying in the beginning that not only one factor uh, drives connectivity, we need to have a very holistic approach to this. And we need to have cooperation across the board from operators, investors, and regulators, but also the users and local communities are important. So the multi-stakeholder model in some areas are more important than others. So it's, it's an important uh, part of, of the model too. But on the other side, we also need, of course, to uh, help uh, generate demand because connectivity without the demand is, is not uh, of, of no use. So we need to have some, some things that are uh, needed for the population and skills, the right skills is also extremely important. We need people to know and trust how to use the internet. Um, and, and we have seen, I think Robert told us uh, the, the huge impact it can have uh, on many societies on their uh, GDP. I, I still think there are challenges uh, and um, they are, uh, there are some difficulties and regulators need to have a predictable law, which is uh, key for making business cases attractive to investors. And we also need the uh, regulation to to be uh, um, to, to help us make a business model sustainable. We saw it with uh, Peru, where it actually helped creating the investment and, and some new business models. And Open RAN can can help us keep costs low uh, for network uh, rollout and contributing massively to GDP growth again. So uh, that said, I have huge uh, confidence in that we are looking at ambitions, both from operators and other parts of private companies and, and the ecosystem who are ready to innovate uh, and, and uh, have new projects in the future. So the future oriented approach to regulation we've seen in Egypt, ITU, we have also seen in Poland, great to, to hear those case studies. And uh, I see those rules can help us make uh, connectivity and drive connectivity. And I, I think it was Sophie saying, we need to see uh, regulators as facilitators. And uh, I think that's a good way to, to end this uh, uh, by saying, we have a lot of opportunities. We have a lot of, of stakeholders who are eager to, to roll out good infrastructure, make the whole world uh, connected. And we need uh, all of us to, to break down the barriers to connectivity. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks.